Although my talk today is going to be very objective in the sense that I'm going to talk about the history and the characteristics of chant, I do want to start with a brief personal note. Um, chant, for me, it's been hugely influ influential in my own life as a Catholic. Um, as I talk about at greater length in the book that Father was just holding up, Tradition and Sanity, um, I discovered chant in high school as a junior, I think I was in high school. I was involved in the music program at my all boys, Benedictine High School. And unfortunately, the monks there were rather progressive and they didn't sing chant anymore. Um, so I discovered one day in the music library a bunch of old copies of the Graduale Romanum. It's this nice black volume published in the 1940s um, that has all of the chants, the, the propers and ordinary of the mass according to the monastic liturgy. And I asked my music teacher what this was, and he said, oh, well, that's the chant book that the monks used to use. I said, are they using it? He said, no. Could I have a copy? <laughs> I, I thought it was quite intriguing. I had no idea what this book was. It had all these strange hieroglyphics in it, you know, the way the chant looks when you've never seen it before. And, and uh, I was just kind of intrigued by this as somebody interested in music in general. Um, so then I went out to a record shop and I bought, I asked them, you know, show me where the Gregorian chant section is. Uh, and it was a big enough record shop that they had a few, you know, somewhere. And so I picked up my first chant CD and I looked in the index of the book and I found in the book where the chants were on the CD and I just listened to them over and over again. I taught myself how to read the chant from listening to the monks singing because I, at that time, nobody I knew knew anything about chant. Um, and so I actually consider that to be a turning point in my life. I didn't know what the role of chant was in the liturgy. I had never been to a liturgy that had used chant by that time. Um, and, and yet there was something magical, if I could use that word, mysterious, alluring to these chants as I was listening to the recording of them. And it planted a seed in me to somehow to pursue that, to find out where that came from and, and, and what's it all about. So I actually kind of date that as the beginning of my conversion or reversion or whatever you want to call it to a more traditional Catholicism. Um, then I just want to mention that fast forwarding later, my wife and I are blessed with two children, my son Julian, some of you have met him, um, and my daughter Rose. Uh, and when each of them was born, and I received the baby in my arms for the first time, I started singing chant to them. Um, and I remember very distinctly with Julian, I started with the Salve Regina, and I went through all the Marian antiphons, the Regina Celi, the Ave Regina Celorum, and the, the um, Alma Retum Tori's Mater. And every time they would fuss at night, I would just sing chant to them, and it would always calm them down. Um, so, now my son Julian is discerning his vocation at a Benedictine monastery in Ireland. Um, it's a monastery called Silverstream, maybe some of you have heard of it, uh, where they spend about five hours a day chanting the praises of God. And um, I attribute that much more to God's grace than to anything I did, but certainly I think it didn't hurt to hear chant from the moment they were born. So, so one might think that something called plain chant or plain song would not furnish much to talk about. After all, its very name says it's plain and it's chant. In reality, Gregorian chant is anything but plain, except in the sense that its beautiful melodies are meant to be sung unaccompanied and unharmonized as befits the ancient monastic culture out of which they sprang. What we call Gregorian chant is one of the richest and most subtle art forms in Western music, indeed in the music of any culture. And in fact, if you look at any reputable book on the history of music, it will say something like, Gregorian chant contains the largest body of developed melody of any music known to man. In my presentation today, I will first give a rapid sketch of the history of chant, and then I will spend most of my time talking about the characteristics that make it uniquely suited to the sacred liturgy. 
So I have some slides to go along with, uh, with my talk. Most of the time, I won't be referring heavily to the slides. They can just be ornamental. To understand the origins of chant, we must go back to the church's Hebrew roots. This nicely dovetails with um, the last lecture. The tradition of chanting scripture, a practice known as cantillation, began at least 1,000 years before the birth of Christ. In the Old Testament, the book of Psalms and the books of Chronicles speak of musical instruments and the central function of music in temple worship. There were two basic forms of worship for the Israelite, the bloody sacrifice involving the death and destruction of an animal, which represents the total surrender of one's being to God in adoration, obedience, and humble self-effacement, and the chanted Psalter, expressing our praises and petitions as verbal incense offered up to God by our intellects. Since the Psalter of David was composed for the very purpose of divine worship and was seen as the messianic book par excellence, the first Christians spontaneously chose the Psalter for their prayer book. They didn't write a new prayer book, they just took the one that they already had. So already we see that principle of liturgical conservatism. We see Peter, Paul, and the Apostolic Fathers quoting it countless times in their preaching and letters. Moreover, Christians saw the Lord's offering of himself on the cross as the fulfillment of all the bloody animal sacrifices. You see that most clearly in the epistle to the Hebrews. The Eucharist makes present the reality and fruits of this supreme sacrifice in an unbloody manner suitable for those who have been redeemed. Thus, all Christian liturgy can be said to spring from the combination of psalter and sacrifice. We should not be surprised then to find that the traditional Roman rite of mass, which is primarily a sacrificial offering, is permeated throughout with verses from the Psalms, and that the other great public prayer of the church, the divine office or liturgy of the hours, is primarily composed of psalms, yet with incense burned at the altar during the gospel canticles at least in its solemn form, an acknowledgement of the one supreme sacrifice that unites heaven and earth. The early Christians continued to chant psalms and other prayers in the Hebrew manner familiar to them from the temple worship in Jerusalem and from the synagogues spread throughout the Roman world. Some Gregorian melodies still in use today are remarkably close to Hebrew synagogue melodies, most notably the ancient gospel tone, in illo tempore, Dicit Jesus a discipulos suos, that tone, the preface tone of the Mass, and the tone used for Psalm 113, in Exitu Israel de Egypto, which is called the Tonus Peregrinus. It's the only psalm that uses that psalm tone. So my first audio example is, it's a recording where we first hear a Jewish cantor singing a verse in Hebrew from Psalm 113, followed by a scola singing the same verse in Latin in the Tonus Peregrinus. Um, and you'll hear right away the similarities between the two tones. I like to imagine the Hebrew chant as the voice of our Lord and the Latin chant as the response of his bride, the Catholic Church, in her Western sphere. <laughs> Wonderful to see that parallel there. But Christians also absorbed Christians also absorbed influences from surrounding Greek and Roman music, particularly in the development of the system of eight modes. This system, like so much else, developed separately in the Latin and Byzantine realms, which roughly correspond to the western and eastern halves of the ancient Roman Empire. To this day, most Latin chants and most Byzantine chants fall into eight modes. But the only thing these modes have in common is that there are eight of them. Um, I'll talk more about modes later. But for now, I just thought I would play you 
this really fascinating piece of music. It's called the Song of Cyclos. It's considered to be the oldest extant musically notated song that we have. It's from the second, first or second century AD. There's some debate about that. And it was carved into a sarcophagus um, by a Greek. It's a Greek song. Uh, and they, they, they don't, obviously they didn't use this modern musical notation because that wasn't invented until many, many centuries later, um, really in the Middle Ages. Uh, what they used was they used a system of letters to represent notes. So the scholars have been able to reconstruct is being played on a reconstructed um, ancient Greek harp. So it's probably a pretty good um, impression of what the music would have been like in the pagan circles um, in, in ancient times. And what I find fascinating about the melody is that the melody itself, if you kind of slow it down the way that uh, it sh you, can, you can almost hear a Gregorian chant melody in that, like puernatus. Puernatus est nobis. So it's, you can see, so it's the Hebrew and the Greek Roman influences. Chant developed prodigiously in the first Christian millennium. Over time, not just the Psalms and their antiphons were cantillated, but also the scripture readings, orations, intercessions, litanies, instructions. For example, flectamus genua, right? let's kneel. It's a very simple thing to say, but it was sung. And in general, anything meant to be proclaimed out loud. By the time we reach Pope St. Gregory the Great, who reigned from 590 to 604, a body of chant already existed for the sacrifice of the Mass and the daily round of prayer, the divine office. Even as he gave final form to the Roman canon, which is the defining trait of the Latin rite, St. Gregory organized this musical repertoire, as a result of which the chant ever afterwards has been honored with his name, Gregorian. The core of the Gregorian chant repertoire dates to before the year 800. The bulk of it was completed by the year 1200. It deserves mention that the chant of the Roman Church was not the only chant being used in the Latin-speaking sphere of the Catholic Church. There was also the Ambrosian chant of Milan. There's a picture of St. Ambrose there at the top. The Mozarabic chant in Spain and the Gallican chant of Gaul, modern-day France. As different as their melodies and particular texts were, these regional types of chant shared the exclusive use of the Latin language and the system of eight modes. Due to Charlemagne's centralizing ambitions and his allegiance to the papacy, the Roman rite was brought into the Frankish Empire. During its trans-alpine sojourn, many Gallican elements were incorporated into the Roman rite. Later on, these migrated back to Rome. The medieval Roman liturgy was, therefore, an amalgamation of ancient Roman and Gallican sources. This is why the, the, high, the highfalutin scholars like to call it the Romano-Gallican liturgy uh, instead of just the Roman liturgy. And we get a lot of important things from Gaul, such as the procession with palms on Palm Sunday. That was not originally part of the Roman liturgy, but part of the Frankish liturgy, and it came back to Rome. Another example would be saying the creed or singing the creed at Mass was also done last in Rome. It was done everywhere else first, and finally the Romans capitulated and decided to sing it as well. Since chant was the custom-made music that had grown up with the church's liturgy, the chant traveled wherever the liturgy traveled. No one dreamed of separating the texts of the liturgy from their music. They were like a body-soul composite or a happily married couple. Or you could compare the chant to the vestments worn by the priests. The chants are the garments worn by the liturgical texts. We might even dare with medieval freedom to apply the words of Psalm 103 to the chant in relation to the liturgy. Actually, let me just comment for a moment. I've got this map here 
what the map shows is the different ritual families that developed in the first millennium, in fact, the, the beginning of the first millennium of Christianity. Um, and it, it, we have so many different rites in the church. They're all ancient, they're all traditional, they're all equal, they're all apostolic. Um, the Latin rite, the Byzantine rite, the Antiochian rite, the Alexandrian rite, that's the original cluster. Um, then you have the Ambrosian rite in Milan, the Gallican rite in France, the Celtic rite, which unfortunately has long since perished. Um, the Mozarabic rite, which still survives in one place, Toledo. Um, and then you have different forms of the Byzantine liturgy, the, the, the liturgy of St. Basil, the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, the liturgy of the pre-sanctified gifts. Um, Armenian, yes, a little hard to read from here. The Armenian liturgy, the Jerusalem West Syrian liturgy, um, the Chaldean liturgy, Syro-Malabar, Syro-Malankara, Coptic, right? So all of these different liturgies which proceeded from a, a number of parent cells and then spread as Christianity spread. What I, the point I want to make about this is every one of these liturgies is chanted. They all have their own ancient body of chant. And to this day, they're all chanted except for the Roman rite. That is to say, the Roman rite is the only rite among all of these that has stopped chanting its liturgy as, in, in large part. And that, I think, is a serious um, aberration for reasons that will become apparent. So we need to get back with all these other rites, doing what we should be doing. So we might dare with medieval freedom to apply the words of Psalm 103 to the chant in relation to the liturgy. Thou hast put on praise and beauty and art clothed with light as with a garment. In the transfiguration of Christ, there were two elements, the mortal body of our Savior and the radiance of glory he allowed to shine through his body from a soul already enraptured with the beatific vision. In some ways, the chanted text is a transfigured text, radiant with an otherworldly glory that reminds us of our true home. Gregorian chant flourished in the period circa 600 to the mid 16th century. The Council of Trent, which met from, you can see, 1545 to 1563, reaffirmed the place of chant in the liturgy and discouraged the use of excessively complex polyphonic music, especially when it was based on secular tunes. Yes, we've had this problem before. <laughs> Nevertheless, there began to be a decline in the use and quality of chant, caused in part by the increasing splendor, variety, and quantity of instrumental and polyphonic music. Monteverdi's Vespers of the Blessed Virgin Mary and Handel's Carmelite Vespers, you're seeing Monteverdi and Handel there, would be two fine examples of the kind of music that supplanted simpler forms, at least where patrons could afford it. The accent on splendor was particularly emphasized by the Counter-Reformation, which coincided with the Baroque phase of the fine arts. This, mean, this meant that, to some tastes, chant was just a little too plain for the perceived needs of the moment. It continued to be used, of course, but it was sidelined. Old melodies became abbreviated or corrupted. Neumes, that is the little groups of notes, were forced to conform to a regular beat like the metered music of the day. And new chants were written that lacked the inspiration and savor of the originals. One who picked up a graduale in Germany in the 19th century, and here's a page, a sample from such a graduale, would find melodies stripped of their melismas or melodic embellishments so that they could be chanted as quickly as possible and the choir could get on with the real music in parts or with instruments. This utilitarianism, right, which was ordered to just getting the liturgical text out of the way as quickly as possible so that something else could be performed, took away the chief beauty of the chants in their original form and spoiled the internal balance of the parts of the liturgy. Restoration of such an immense treasure of the church and such an integral part of her solemn liturgy was bound to come sooner or later. It came through the combined efforts of a monk and a pope. Dom Prosper Guéranger, uh, 1805 to 1875, founded Salem Abbey in 1833 and built it up into a powerhouse of monastic observance, including the fully chanted divine office and mass. The monks of Salem poured over hundreds of ancient and medieval manuscripts 
in their work to restore the chant's distinctive melodies and rhythms. That's Salem Monastery down there at the bottom. Now, this lecture could rapidly become five lectures, so I have to be really careful not to spend too much time on any one thing. But I do want to point out that what we think of as the notation of Gregorian chant is a late development. It's a medieval development we call square notes. Um, what chant looked like originally was this, okay? So what you had was uh, you had liturgical books in which the text, in this case a gradual from the mass, was written out, and then little, um, little nooms, as the, to use the technical term, little signs were written above the syllables, reminding the cantors or the scola of a melody that they already knew. So this is a mnemonic device. It's not actually musical notation the way we think of it. What it's telling them is where to lift their voice, where to go down, how many pitches to go down. So it's, it's a quasi-musical notation. Um, and the monks who sang this, and the clergy canons who sang this music day in and day out, they would be able to look at this and say, oh, I remember that chant. <laughs> That's how it goes. And so here's the... So, of course, the disadvantage of this system is that you have to know the music already in order to make any sense of this. Uh, and therefore, the square notes were developed later as a teaching device to teach new monks um, or, or young clerics more quickly how to chant. And of course, it's a very useful system for that, but it loses some of the subtlety that these nooms have. But that's a whole separate topic, so I'll leave that. So the monks of Salem were looking at manuscripts um, from various periods. Uh, and down there, this one picture here in the lower right corner shows a Salem publication with the square notes and the nooms from two different manuscripts. So the square notes are an attempt to put into a different form what those squiggly lines are also telling us. And of course, this was a huge labor that the monks undertook to look at all of these manuscripts throughout Europe, everything they could get their hands on, um, so that they could restore the chant to its original beauty. Soon after his accession in 1903, Pope St. Pius X met in Rome with monks of Salem and placed on their shoulders the monumental task of publishing all of the liturgical books of chant with corrected melodies and rhythms. From this papal directive was born a long string of influential publications from Salem, most of which are still in use today, most notably the Liber Usualis, that large book, the Graduale Romanum, and the Antiphonale Monasticum. And some of these books are out there on the table for sale from Paraclete Press. It's a remarkable labor of love. From Guéranger, Salem, and Pius X to chapter six of the Second Vatican Council's Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, Sacrosanctum Concilium, is a straight and logical line. Chapter six is the most conservative and least problematic of all of the chapters of that document. I mean, almost nobody has a problem with chapter six unless you hate traditional liturgical music. So let me share with you some choice words from that document, from chapter six of that document, words that many of you may already be familiar with. Quote, the musical tradition of the universal church is a treasure of inestimable value, greater even than that of any other art. It's a remarkable statement, right? Greater even than Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris is Gregorian chant. That's what the council is saying here. The main reason for this preeminence is that as sacred song united to the words, it forms a necessary or integral part of the solemn liturgy. So you can chant mass in the middle of an open field, um, but you still need the chant to do that. So chant is more fundamental to the liturgy than architecture, for example. Accordingly, the sacred council, keeping to the norms and precepts of ecclesiastical tradition and discipline, and having regard to the purpose of sacred music, which is the glory of God and the sanctification of the faithful, decrees as follows. And among the things it decrees are these. Liturgical worship is given a more noble form when the divine offices are celebrated solemnly in song. The treasure of sacred music is to be preserved and fostered with great care. Choirs must be diligently promoted. And then the, the real kicker. 
The church acknowledges Gregorian chant as specially suited to the Roman liturgy, with the result that, other things being equal, it ought to be given the foremost place in liturgical services. But other kinds of sacred music, especially polyphony, are by no means excluded from liturgical celebrations so long as they accord with the spirit of the liturgical action. That's Vatican II. Now, I have to say that the first time I read these words many years ago, I was dumbfounded. They corresponded to nothing whatsoever that I had ever experienced as a Catholic growing up in America in the 1970s and 1980s, attending a church with purple carpets, Star Trek lighting, and heavily amplified singers, where the gold standard was on eagle's wings. <laughs> the original liturgical movement out of which these stirring words of Sacrosanctum Concilium came was devoted to restoring and recovering the richest and most beautiful traditions of Catholic prayer, not to abandoning them and replacing them with second or third-rate folksy substitutes. An explosive combination of fantasy antiquarianism and a craze for aggiornamento, or modernization, effectively burned down the house of Catholic worship, obliterating chant from the lives of Catholics. The good news is that a slow process of rebuilding here and there, and here in particular, has brought back Gregorian chant from near extinction to a moderately flourishing condition again. In any case, chant will never die because it is perfect liturgical music. And whenever this fact is rediscovered, people fall in love with it all over again. Now, the Council Fathers offered no explanation of why Gregorian chant is the music proper to the Roman Rite, or why, more broadly speaking, ancient chant is proper to the celebration of the liturgy. Were they simply taking it for granted? That might have been naive of them. It goes without saying that it cannot be taken for granted today, at least in the West. My goal in the second part of my talk is to provide a rationale for the consistent and predominant use of Gregorian chant in the Roman Rite, or in any of the other Western Rites. Before I go into the eight special qualities of chant, I would like to tackle a more basic question. Why do we sing our liturgical texts? Why not just speak them? In all religions of the world, we find the chanting of sacred texts. This universal practice derives from an intuitive sense that holy things and the holy sentiments that go along with them should not be talked about as ordinary everyday things are, but elevated to a higher level through melodious modulation or submerged into silence. Authentic rituals, therefore, tend to alternate between silences and chanting. Both of these may take place by themselves or in conjunction with symbolic actions. That is to say, you could have a, a time in the liturgy when chanting is occurring and nothing else, um, or you could have a time when chanting is occurring while something else is being done, like the, off the offertory rite. The contrast between singing, which is human expression at its highest, and silence, which is a deliberate withholding of discourse, is more striking than the contrast between speaking and not speaking. The former is like the rise and fall of ocean waves, while the latter seems more like switching a light bulb on and off. So this is the reason why silence works so much better in complementarity with chant than it does simply with speech. Speech and silence are like a light switch. Song and silence are like the rise and fall of waves. Speech is primarily discursive and instructional, aimed at a listener while song, which more easily and naturally unites many singers into one body, is capable of being, in addition, the bearer of feelings and of meanings that go beyond what words can convey, greatly augmenting the penetrating power of the words themselves. We find this especially in the melismas of chant, the lengthy melodic elaborations on a single syllable that give voice to inner emotions and aspirations that words cannot fully express. Here's a wonderful example of a melisma-filled chant from the Paschal season, the offertory chant for Easter Thursday, which takes a verse from the Old Testament, from Exodus chapter 13, and applies it to newborn Christians. In the day of your solemnity, saith the Lord, I will bring you into a land flowing with milk and honey. Alleluia. In the
So I, I, I chose that chant. I could have chosen, you know, from a thousand other ones, but I chose it because it's Paschal time, but or the end of Paschal time, I guess. But also because um, it gives some great examples of melismas. So the, the final Alleluia, right? You could sing that in four notes. Hallelujah, right? but it takes a lot more notes to get that that word out because it's it's more than just about the word. It's about the word beyond the word. It's about as as Dr. Schmidtke was saying. It's about the infinite word that no words can express. Um, and you see that on a number of words here: dominus, um, inducam, teram, fluentem. Right? These are all words that are very much drawn out. Um, and I'm going to talk later about why the chant does that with words. The philosopher Victor Zuckerkandl says, quote, music is appropriate, is helpful, where self-abandon is intended or required, where the self goes beyond itself, where subject and object come together. Tones seem to provide the bridge that makes it possible, or at least makes it easier, to cross the boundary separating the two. By means of the tones, the speaker goes out to the things, brings the things from outside within himself, so that they are no longer the other, something alien that he is not, but the other and his own in one. The singer remains what he is, but his self is enlarged. His vital range is extended. Being what he is, he can now, without losing his identity, be with what he is not. And the other, being what it is, can, without losing its identity, be with him." Unquote. Ultimately, it comes down to this. We sing when we are at one or wish to be at one with our activity or the object of our activity. This is true when we are in love with another person. That's what inspires most singing. It is most of all true when we are in love with God. That is the origin of the incomparably great music of the Catholic tradition. St. Augustine says, only the lover sings. We sing and we whisper and we fall silent. In the course of his discussion, Zuckerkandl makes a point that reminds me painfully of years of growing up in the Novus Ordo with congregations reciting together the Gloria or the Holy, Holy, Holy. Zuckerkandl says, can one imagine that people come together to speak songs? One can, but only as a logical possibility. In real life, this would be absurd. It would turn something natural into something utterly unnatural, unquote. The recitation of normatively sung texts at a low mass works only because the priest alone is saying the texts and doing so at the altar ad orientem. He is not addressing the words of the song to anyone except God. They thereby acquire a ritual status comparable to that of the recited canon, the silent canon. The speaking of sung texts is not liturgically ideal. Really, this form of mass, the low mass, developed for the personal devotion of the priest when celebrating at a side altar with an, a clerk or an acolyte. To have a large church packed with people and then to say the songs together rather than singing them should strike everyone as odd. Then there are the practical reasons for singing. As experience proves, texts that are sung or chanted with correct elocution are heard with greater clarity and forcefulness in a large assembly of people than texts that are read aloud or even shouted. The music has a way of carrying the words and making them penetrate the listener's ears and souls. Though I could say, Dominus Vobiscum, or I could sing, Dominus Vobiscum, and that immediately makes it a much more penetrating proclamation. In ancient times, epic and lyric poetry and even parts of political speeches were chanted for this very reason. Right? Homer and Virgil were chanted. Acts of public worship are rendered more solemn and their content more appealing and memorable by the singing of clergy, cantors, choir, and congregation. Allow me to digress for a moment on the use of microphones and speakers in churches. Hope uh, Magdalene is here somewhere <laughs> um, to hear this. Electrical amplification is very helpful in a situation like this, giving a lecture, or in an airplane, uh, in an airport, where you need to hear your name called or the gate called. But electrical amplification is unnecessary when architects build churches that resonate properly and liturgical ministers learn how to sing out. 
A well-built church with well-trained singers has absolutely no need of artificial amplification. Moreover, contrary to one of the key assumptions behind the recovation of our rights, not everything in the liturgy has to be seen or heard by everybody. Obviously, one can't imagine a modern-day airport without loudspeakers, but when the same technical, pragmatic, impersonal, and unfocused type of sound production invades churches, it is a tragedy. In a church, the microphone kills the intimacy, humility, locality, and directionality of the human voice. The voice now becomes that of a placeless giant, a big brother larger than life, coming from everywhere and nowhere, dominating and subduing the listener. Putting mics and speakers in a church does not enhance a natural process, it subverts it. There is no continuum between the unaided voice and the artificially amplified voice. They are two separate phenomena with different phenomenologies. Okay, end of rant. <laughs> so then, on to these special characteristics of chant. The first characteristic is the primacy of the word. Chant is, above all, music in service of God's revealed word, to which it grants primacy. It is sung prayer, a form of that logike latreia, or rational worship, that St. Paul in the Epistle to the Romans says we are to offer up to God. The chant exists to proclaim and interpret divine words or human poetry inspired by divine words. In this respect, it is unlike much later music, where the text serves almost as an excuse for the music, a necessary scaffolding for human voices, or where texts of human authorship can be of inferior quality or theologically problematic. Most Gregorian chants deliver to us God's own words in scripture, sung in musical phrases that draw out the words depth of meaning. Dame Jacques Ullier quotes Father Hamelin, who says, it is not a question of adding music to the words, nor even of setting words to music. Instead, it is a question of making the words bring forth the music they already contain. Chant is an exegesis of the text. The melody and rhythm is not casually or incidentally related to the text, but unpacks and savors its truth, emphasizing this or that aspect of it. This is the reason why we can call chant musical Lexio Divina. It illuminates the words much as medieval scribes illuminated capitals and decorated the margins of their books. Now, I, I'm afraid about time here, so I'm just going to point out um, this chant as an example. It's, um, it's a communion chant from the, I believe it's the second Sunday after Epiphany. So it's connected with the gospel of our Lord's first sign or miracle at the wedding feast of Cana. Um, and if we, um, oh, let's listen to it, okay. <laughs> but what I want you to pay attention to is um, the way that the chant brings out the, the drama that's in this text, right? Um, what, what it says is, uh, it says, the Lord says, fill up the water jars with water and bring them to the head steward, the architraclinus. Um, when the head steward tasted the water made wine, he, said, he, he says to the, to the bridegroom, you have served, you have saved the best wine until last. Um, this first sign Jesus did um, in the company of his disciples. Uh, so by the way, it's very interesting when you look at the text of John, the anonymous author of this chant has really carefully chosen the words he wants to use. There are a lot more words in the account in John, but he's kind of, you know, uh, brought it down, boiled it down to its essence. <laughs> Oh. Uh -huh. 
So what we see in this wonderful chant is really an exegesis of the text of John. It's an interpretation of it. Um, and, and it's even, uh, I often find this with chants, that there's, there's sometimes even a bit of word painting going on. It's very subtle. But in this chant, for example, when they're filling up those water jars, you know, they talk about filling up the water jars, uh, it starts with a lower, lower pitches, almost like the action of filling up the water jars. And then they're brought to the, to the head steward and the melody climbs almost like a procession, right? And then he tastes it, cum gustaset, and the melody does this little funny turn, like, whoa, he just tastes it, you know? And he's like, what happened there? It goes from the T to the te, makes a neat little sh shift. Um, and then he exclaims, right, that you have saved the best wine for last, and it really just soars at that point, like he's in ecstasy right now. It's perfect, perfect. You could never get that just from reading that text out, just reading the text out. All right. Second characteristic, free rhythm. Precisely on account of the foregoing characteristic, that is that it's using the words of scripture, Gregorian chant is ametrical or non-metrical, the only music of its kind in the Western tradition. Gregorian musical phrases follow the irregular rhythm of the scriptural texts. Unlike the pagan poets of Greece and Rome, the Hebrews did not have metered poetry. They didn't write in dactylic hexameter or something like that. The Greek and Latin translations of the Psalms faithful to the original, the character of the original, are not metrical either. Moreover, the church fathers were opposed to the use of strongly rhythmical language in the litur uh, music in the liturgy, music with a beat, as it smacked too much of pagan cults, which used that kind of music to kind of pump people up in a Dionysian fashion, kind of like life teen or something. You know? Because chant is not confined to a predetermined grid of beats, such as duple or triple time, think of a march or a waltz, but conforms to the syllables of the words, its phrases seem to float, flow along, meander, and soar. It breathes rather than marching ahead. It moves with a wave-like undulation or like birds circling in the sky. Non-metricality and modality are the two characteristics that most obviously distinguish chant from all other music. A large part of the magic of chant is caused by its unconstrained fluidity and freedom of motion, which seems to break out of the hegemony of earthly time and the constraints of the flesh represented by the beat. Father Mosier talked about this a little bit yesterday. So. In the old Salem method, one can illustrate the non-metricality of chant by counting groups of twos and threes, the so-called binary and ternary groupings. So, for, for example, in this uh, introit from Advent, um, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two. Um, so what that shows when you group it in twos and threes is that there isn't a meter. I mean, if you were going to put um, metrical indications in this, it would look like a score by Igor Stravinsky, you know, three, four, two, four, two, you know, it could be going back and forth all the time, right? You can't do it. It's impossible. As criticized as this approach has been, the Salem approach of binary and ternary groupings, uh, it's written off as a romantic reconstruction no alternative method has proved capable of equaling the old Salem method in lyricism, tranquility of spirit, ensemble unanimity, and liturgical fittingness, let alone pedagogical clarity and ease, which, as a teacher, I can assure you, is hugely important. Since these qualities are rather important for us as believers and worshipers, my vote still goes with the old Salem method in general. Although I do not mind incorporating ideas from the more recent Salem school, such as repercussions of notes in a distropha or tristropha, the omission of the vertical epizema, the extension of one note horizontal epizemas over neighboring notes, and other things like that. Now we're really talking, you know, 
uh, baseball, as they say. Still, it is always my advice that new or large scholas should sing together with the old solem method, while only the cantors or a small scola of picked singers should try to bring in any of the newer uh, insights, paleographical insights, and only to the extent that it produces edifying results. Third characteristic, modality. A mode may be defined as a particular sequence of whole steps and half steps, taking for granted the Western predilection for eight steps in a scale. That's why we talk about octaves, octave meaning eighth. So we have eight steps in our musical scales. Other cultures had somewhat different scales, like the Hindus have you know, 13 notes in their scale or something like that. Um, but Western musical civilization is completely unanimous about eight notes in the scale among which there is a dominant or reciting tone and a final tone on which the music comes to rest. The eight modes fall into four authentic modes, one, three, five, and seven, called Dorian, Phrygian, Lydian, and Mixolydian, and four plagal modes, two, four, six, and eight, called Hypodorian, Hypophrygian, Hypolydian, and my favorite, Hypomixolydian. A plagal mode has the same final, but starts a fourth below it and ends a fifth above it. Obviously, we can't go into too much detail about this, but the main point I want to make is this. All pre-Baroque Western music, and some post-Baroque music too, was written using these modes, these eight modes. Scarborough Fair, for example, is in the Dorian mode, as are many other English folk songs. But due to the prodigious development of harmony in the Renaissance and of harmonic theory in the Baroque era, music after 1600 crystallized around what came to be called major and minor keys, which correspond more or less to only two of the, eight, or the original eight modes. While the major minor system of tonality allowed for sophisticated chord sequences and dramatic modulations, melodies were forced into tighter confines and the subtle variations in feel or mood made possible by the modes were lost, except in chant. And how wonderfully various are these modal moods. Medieval musicologists assigned a special descriptive epithet to each mode. The first was called modus gravis, the second, the, the serious mode, the second modus tristis, the sad mode, the third modus mysticus, the mystical mode, the fourth modus harmonicus, uh, the fifth modus letus, the joyful mode. Um, the sixth modus devotus, the devout, or maybe even introspective uh, mode. The seventh modus angelicus, and the eighth modus perfectus. And it's really neat when you start looking at chants in these different modes, you can actually pick up the reasons why the medievals use these names. They, they actually suit the character of the mode very well. Because our ears are so habituated to the major minor key system, Gregorian chants, which employ eight different modes that seldom conform to our modern musical expectations, strike us as otherworldly, haunting, incomplete, or to use a term that has been applied to Byzantine icons, brightly sad. We should rejoice in this fact, which illustrates a general rule. An ancient art form is more not less likely to be associated by a modern believer with the holiness and unchanging truth of God, his strangeness or otherness, his transcendent mystery, the special homage he deserves, and the need for our conversion from the flesh to the spirit, that is, from a worldly mentality to a godly one. As St. Paul says, be not conformed to this world, but be reformed in the newness of your mind. The very differentness of the ancient art form or the medieval art form, which the passing of ages has only accentuated, acquires theological and religious significance. We see the same thing with the use of ancient liturgical languages, silver or gold chalices, ornamented priestly vestments, the wearing of veils by women, and Romanesque or Gothic architecture. See, all of those things were once much more common. They were found much more widely, but as time goes on, they become more and more restricted to the sacred domain. And therefore, they've acquired expressive and impressive power due to their long-standing exclusive association with divine worship. In other words, I want to say that we have advantages, in a sense, that medieval people didn't have. Because to medieval people, the, chant, the eight modes 
didn't sound all that strange. It was pretty much the only music that they ever heard. To us, it does sound strange because we've had hundreds of years of musical development since then. The fourth characteristic, unison singing. Because the focus in Gregorian chant is on the word of God as it gathers us into the one body of Christ, it is eminently fitting that it be sung in unison. That is, everyone singing the same melody at the same time. Now, technically, men and women are singing at octaves. It's not really unison, but it sounds like unison to us because the octave is, is a two-to-one ratio, and it's, it's, it just, we don't even think about it as a, as a different pitch. We just think about it as unison. Um, as a 1974 document from the Vatican put it, another document that was incidentally ignored by nearly everyone, quote, Gregorian chant will continue to be a bond that forms the members of many nations into a single people, gathered together in Christ's name with one heart, one mind, and one voice. This living unity is symbolized by the union of voices that otherwise speak in different languages, accents, and inflections is a striking manifestation of the diversified harmony of the one church." Unquote. That's from the introduction to Jubilate Deo, uh, which was a little collection of the minimum repertoire of chant that everyone should know. That's what Jubilate Deo was. The subtle rhythm of chant and the much admired inventiveness and intricacy of its melodies are in fact only possible because of this insistence at once practical and symbolic on unison singing. Harmonized music, whether Palestrina or Monteverdi, adds splendor to ceremonies, but it involves a certain sacrifice in melodic purity and complexity. While I am passionately fond of polyphonic mass ordinaries and have composed a few myself, I nevertheless believe that there are irreducibly distinct and great qualities in the plain chant masses that make them singularly appropriate to the spirit and letter of the liturgical texts. We can make a few generalizations about the Gregorian chants of the ordinary. So here's um, Kyrie number nine, one of my favorites. The Kyrie with its melismatic melodies has the character of intensely pleading for divine mercy. Its traditional ninefold structure gives it a doubly underlined Trinitarian character. As befits a longer text, the Gloria chants are syllabic or pneumatic, that is, each syllable of the text is set to one musical note, or at most a few notes, and full of solemn joy, in keeping with a hymn intoned by angels in honor of the redemption. The Credo melodies, I don't have a Credo, but the Credo melodies are simple and stately, graceful and balanced, perfectly paced for the prayerful confession of the dogmas of faith. Like the Gloria, they tend to avoid melismas, except in the final Amen. The chant settings of the Sanctus, hymn of the angels par excellence, are particularly solemn, owing to the proximity of this prayer to the offering of the holy victim on the altar. So we're kind of thinking in terms of chronology of the liturgy, we're coming closer and closer to the great miracle, and that's, and that's reflected in the character of the chants, I believe. The Sanctus often features broad, lofty, noble, soaring, ecstatic melodies. And then finally, the Agnus Dei, a miniature litany that complements the penitential Kyrie, features a tripartite structure. The melodies are focused, imploring, and reserved, since they are being chanted in the very presence of the king. Um, so in other words, the, 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 fir the first four parts of the Mass Ordinary are all pre-consecration, but the Agnus Dei is post-consecration. So once again, that makes a difference in the character of the music. It's so subtle, but it's so effective. You don't even need to know this, you just experience it. But when you think about it, you just marvel at it all the more. All right, the fifth characteristic, unaccompanied vocalization. To this day, Eastern Christian tradition does not allow instrumental music in the liturgy. That's my little silly thing with the organ. <laughs> it has clung to the ancient rule that in the temple of God, only the human voice should be heard, the God-given inborn instrument of the rational creature remade in the image of the incarnate Logos, Christ, the new song, as St. Clement of Alexandria calls him. While the Western Catholic tradition starting in the Middle Ages was friendlier to the development of both accompanied and instrumental music and with what magnificent results, it cannot be denied that Roman Catholics have often faced the difficulty of keeping our music sacred, or to put it negatively, keeping the profane out of the temple. As Joseph Ratzinger points out, there have been three major periods of encroaching secularism in church music, the century before Trent, 
The century before Pius X's Tralles Licitudini, that was the, the heyday of Italian opera, and the half century after Vatican II down to the present day. Although this fourth characteristic, the unaccompanied vocalization, is perhaps the least startling, especially since there are other types of vocal music frequently sung unaccompanied, such as Renaissance polyphony, it remains true that the sound of the naked human voice raised up to God in prayer is singularly real, sincere, humble, and focused, and less vulnerable to the kind of distractions that come with the use of instruments, especially when they're played virtuosically, rambunctiously, or just plain loudly. Sometimes chant is quietly accompanied by a modest organ accompaniment, but in my judgment, and we can argue about this later, uh, this is not optimal. People learn over time to sing better, more confidently, and with more satisfaction when they're not leaning on an organ for support. There are other reasons too, but I won't go into those. Few things witness more impressively to the unity, antiquity, and universality of the church than a large congregation chanting the creed together at mass, demonstrating in action that the church is one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. Okay, the sixth characteristic. The vast majority of Latin chants were composed by anonymous monks, cantors, and canons. We will never know their names in this life. What a healthy corrective to the egotism that often comes with artistic creativity and performance. Chant quenches distinctive personality, both in that we usually don't know its author, and in that we cannot shine or stand out in a rock star way when singing chant in a scola or congregation. It works against the desire for show, encourages a submersion of one's individuality in Christ, and makes us act and feel as members of his mystical body. Like other traditional liturgical practices, use of chant strips us of the old man and clothes us with Christ. This process of conversion needs to be gentle and continual if it is to be ultimately successful. It cannot be the result of fits of enthusiasm, emotional highs, or psychological violence. The seventh characteristic, emotional moderation. It would be a mistake to say chant is without emotion. The melodies are deeply satisfying to sing and to listen to when well executed. They plumb the depths of joy and exultation, bitterness and sorrow, yearning and trustful surrender. They express many fine shades of feeling. They can even induce tears in one who is spiritually sensitive. However, the emotions in chant are moderate, gentle, noble, and refined. They induce and conduce to meditation, to the flight of the spirit into God who is spirit. In this way, chant is well suited to the ascent of prayer, which begins with a symbol or text that we encounter on which we ruminate, from which desire is kindled, and which, when God favors us, rests in his embrace. I am referring here to the four stages of Lexio Divina, which Guigo the Carthusian identifies as Lexio, Meditatio, Oratio, Contemplatio. So I believe that that process is what chant accomplishes. I mean, chant is not the only thing that does it, but chant does it. The temperance of chant takes on a special importance in our times when so many people live a fast-paced, if not frantic, life, busily rushing over the surface of things, hyped up and wired, excitable and even wearied from too much emotional stimulation. For example, music, movies, videos, internet. In a way that was undoubtedly not as necessary in the Middle Ages, chant becomes for us a medicinal remedy, a health-giving purgative, a summons to greater interiority, an aid for achieving restful silence, a promoter and guardian of right spiritual hierarchy. As Giacomo Broffio says, quote, liturgical prayer teaches us to put ourselves on a wavelength independent of worldly chaos. Gregorian chant has the power to sing, to divert the heart from preoccupations because it orients itself to God in adoration and silence. Unquote. Pope Leo XIII says something similar in a letter from 1901. Quote, in truth, the Gregorian melodies were composed with much prudence and wisdom in order to elucidate the meaning of the words. There resides within them a great strength 
and a wonderful sweetness mixed with gravity, all of which readily stirs up religious feelings in the soul and nourishes beneficial thoughts just when they are needed." Unquote. All right, nearly done here. The eighth characteristic is unambiguous sacrality. This is perhaps the most obvious fact, yet its significance is seldom fully appreciated. Gregorian chant arose exclusively for divine worship and lends itself to no other use, or at least not, it doesn't plausibly lend itself to any other use. It is inherently sacred, that is, set apart for God alone. It is the musical equivalent of incense and vestments, which are not used except for worship. Such things are the privileged honor guard and attendance of Christ, powerfully evoking his presence and effortlessly guiding us into that presence. Chant, says Joseph Swain, is the musical icon of Roman Catholicism. As such, it contrasts with secular styles of music that, when brought into the church, have an ambiguous signification. Are we dealing with our Lord or with the world or even worldliness? Are we lowering God to our own level or asking him to lift us up to share in his divinity, right, as the very Feast of the Ascension reminds us? It's often been remarked that the connection between chant and Catholicism is well exploited by Hollywood movie directors who, whenever they want to evoke a Catholic atmosphere, make sure there is some chant wafting in the background. If only today's clergy had half as much business sense. Of course, present company excluded. So to recapitulate, the eight characteristics of Gregorian chant are primacy of the word, free rhythm, modality, unison singing, unaccompanied vocalization, anonymity, emotional moderation, unambiguous sacrality. These characteristics taken together show us that chant is not only a little bit different from other types of music, but radically and profoundly different. It is liturgical music through and through, existing solely for divine worship, perfectly suited to its verbal sacred nature as well as to the needs of the faithful who associate chant with worship and who find it both beautiful and strange as God himself is. We can see better now why the Second Vatican Council says that chant is a necessary or integral part of the solemn liturgy, why it gives a nobler form to the celebration of the liturgy, and above all, why it is specially suited to the Roman rite and deserves the foremost place in it. When performed in an edifying manner, chant in and of itself accords with the spirit of the liturgical action, which cannot be assumed of any other type of music. It is, in other words, the very definition of what it means to accord with the spirit of the liturgical action, and other musical works must line up to be evaluated, as it were, by this supreme criterion. Even as Pope Pius X had said in his motu proprio from 1903, quote, it is fully legitimate to lay down the following rule. The more closely a composition for church approaches in its movement, inspiration, and savor the Gregorian form, the more sacred and liturgical it becomes. And the more out of harmony it is with that supreme model, the less worthy it is of the temple. Thank you for your kind attention.